So I have the pleasure of introducing our first presenter tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, John Crowley is someone who has already inspired a community and someone who continues to be a beacon in the night for so many starting on this rare disease journey. He's a courageous parent, a tenacious advocate, a successful biotech CEO, a rare project board member, and someone who I'm honored to call a colleague and a friend. Please welcome Mr. John Crowley. Hi, good evening. Good evening and, and thank you and thank you, Nicole, for the introduction and thank you for your passion, your vision, and Lord knows your energy because without you, this night would not be and this organization would not exist. Nicole asked if I'd speak for a couple of minutes this evening just to provide some background with one man and one family's perspective on what it means to be involved in the rare diseases. And that's hard to do because although Hollywood picked our family to tell the story of Pompeii and more broadly of the struggles of people living with rare diseases and the challenges involved in making medicines for some very special people, they could have made that movie about a lot of people, many of whom are in this room tonight. So it was a privilege and an honor for us and I told our children, Megan and Patrick, years ago when we agreed to that project that they would be the proxies in many respects for many many special children and adults who live, who sometimes struggle, and thankfully many days thrive despite enormous challenges. What we look at in biotechnology today and the development of medicines for rare diseases is really special in this country. There is this virtual circle that exists only here in America. It often begins with the patient, the person living with a rare disease, their parents, their family, and it quickly extends to government researchers, university researchers, friends, families, patient organizations, entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, investment bankers, small biotech companies, big biotech companies, international partners, public markets, and then the cycle often repeats itself. We've got representatives in this room from every part of that virtuous circle. And without each of you, we wouldn't make the progress that we've had. We wouldn't be where we are today. We've come a long way. More than 200 of these rare diseases now have approved therapies. But that also means that more than 6,000 don't. I've had the privilege to have met many great people in this journey in the last dozen years of our family. And in just a few minutes, what I'd like to share with you is some lessons I've learned from the very best of them. Lessons about the importance of hope, of about risk taking, and about just taking time and living. And I'll tell you very short vignettes of a person I once met and listened to, someone I once worked with, and someone I live with. When I left the comfort and security of a job in a big pharma company in March of 2000 to help some scientists working in Pompeii disease start a company, I really didn't know what I was doing and didn't know anything about this industry and I wanted to learn. And to do that, I didn't go out and spend the day with researchers of the week. I actually went up to Boston it was March of 2000, and the annual biotechnology industry show was taking place. It had grown over the years, and back then they were probably getting five or 7,000 people to the show. And I went, and I listened, and I learned. I was just kind of a fly on the wall taking it all in, and I went to a keynote address that night. And it was given by a patient, somebody struggling. And there were thousands of people out in the audience, and, and I'll never forget, I mean, I had my personal perspectives on medicine and the challenges of developing medicines for people in need. But the whole business about how you go about it was totally new. And I'll never forget, it was a stage much larger than this and the curtain opened and the gentleman came out and he was in a wheelchair, he was ventilator dependent, and he came out and he started talking in that kind of rhythmic way that people on vents do. And the first word that he said was biotechnology. He said, for 
people like me, that's a great big word that just means hope. He said, it's the hope one day that you, some of you in the audience, might invent a medicine that might treat my paralysis. He said, maybe someday I can walk on the beach with my wife again or play ball with my boys. He said, and I realize that it might not come in time, but it's not just hope for me, it's people, it's hope for people who don't even know that they need hope today. It might be the football player horribly injured in an accident a year from now, whose parents and friends and family go on the internet and search everything they can about paralysis and the medicines. And he said, and they're going to pull up some of your names for work that you haven't even done yet. He said, that's hope. It's true hope tempered with reality. And those words always struck me about providing hope. And when he said it might not come in my day or in my lifetime, when I thought about that, I said, boy, that doesn't seem very optimistic. And years later, when that man, Christopher Reeve, died, I realized that what he said was true. And that was real hope, to the hope he carried with him to the day he passed away. And the hope and the legacy that he's left with for so many. I don't know if in the next year or two or more, or even in our lifetimes, it will cure diseases like San Filippo or Neiman Pixie, ones where we're making progress, we still have a long road to go, but at least so many of you in this room are providing that hope. And the second lesson I learned was from one of our honorees tonight, Henry Tremere. I had the honor of working with Henry for about a year and a half on Pompeii disease. And I remember as a kind of young business person struggling, coming into a business meeting with Henry and explaining the complexities of a Pompeii program and there was a, a lot at stake, personally, professionally, and I went through a very complex program that was unbelievably expensive. And I thought, God, I gotta present this to the CEO. I better be pretty buttoned up. And I went through all the Gantt charts and spreadsheets and all of that and I presented Henry a risk mitigation plan. And I remember he looked at it, and my thought was, God, he's going to kill me if I present this big budget to him. And he looked at me, he says, John, that's great. He said, but I'm not in the risk mitigation business. He says, we're going to do it. It's going to cost a hell of a lot, but it's that important. We're going to do it. And it was a huge lesson for me in the importance of risk taking and really doing things because they need to be done because it's the right thing to do. And because some special people in this world have it in their power to literally change the course of history for some really special people. And in with, we live in these difficult times today economically and people thinking about how do they mitigate risk and more and more in our industry thinking about how they mitigate risk. I'm constantly reminded of people like Henry and the people who founded not just great companies, but founded the industry, and in Henry's case, founded the rare disease industry in biotech. Without Henry's vision, the founders, and so many people at Genzyme, and the companies, and the entrepreneurs, and the scientists and doctors that were mentored under Henry and his team, we wouldn't be here today. And that's so important, the importance of risk-taking, of putting the dreaming, and the dreaming back in biotechnology. And I, have to remind myself that every day. But it's vitally important. And if we don't take risks, sometimes risks that might seem implausible to our boards or our investors or even to ourselves at time, we're never going to do what we have to do. And we're never going to do it in time. And the last short lesson I'll leave with you actually came from my daughter Megan a number of years ago. And they, uh, you know, Megan and Patrick were born. In 1996, 1998, and we were told they wouldn't live to be but a couple of years old. And then finally, in 2003, they began to receive this experimental medicine that helped to stabilize them. And now, in some respects, has reversed parts of the disease. In some respects, has stabilized them. In some respects, hasn't done as much as we'd like, but it's made such a difference. It's bought us a decade of life, of good, 
quality life and of time. And now Patrick is a freshman in high school and Megan's a sophomore and her sweet 16 is this December. And that's, that's about as good as it gets. And I can tell you, sometimes we all get busy in life and trying to balance work and family and doing it all together is really hard sometimes. When I help put together the company that I run now, Amicus in 05, we had some pretty big dreams about what we can do and is always the case in biotech. It takes a bit longer, it's a lot more complex and takes a lot more money than we ever thought. And back in 2007, we had the chance to do our IPO, which for an entrepreneur is, you know, one of the pinnacles of success. And you go around and, you know, all the, the, the bankers treat you nice and you go to meet all these investors and we were a pretty popular little company. And they set up dozens of meetings for you around the world and they put you on these great big private planes and you kind of feel pretty good. And we had a great IPO. We raised $75 million for our little company. And Wall Street valued our company that we'd only formed two years earlier at $300 million. So that, yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> so I felt pretty good about it. We go to New York and we open the stock exchange and all the, the board is there and everybody backslapping. I bust the whole company in, about 75 people at the time. We had a nice celebration, a party, it was great, but I'd been on the road a long time. My wife was there, Eileen, and everybody, most people stayed in New York to have a good time and celebrate and then get back to work. And I wanted to go home because I'd been away a while. So I go home that night and I walked in and checked on John and then Patrick and they're pretty sound sleepers and gave them kisses and said good night. And then I went in Megan's room and Megan is a very light sleeper. So I gave her a kiss and she kind of looked up and she said, Daddy. And she opened up her arms. I said, hello, Megan. She said, I missed you. I missed you too, sweetie. She said, how was your big business trip? I said, well, honey, I said, and I still have my suit on and fancy tie and all. I said, well, honey, I said, you'd be pretty proud of the old man. I think we did well this week. She says, I know. I saw you on TV today. I said, really? I said, so how did I look? It was just me and her in the room. It was kind of dark and just the hum of her ventilator in the background. And she said, well, daddy, she said, actually, you looked Really, really. And I had a good week. I was feeling good. I thought maybe powerful or I didn't know what adjective she was going to pick. She said, you looked really, really kind of short. <laughs> okay, now Megan is the master at how to damn with faint praise. And she said, but that yellow tie showed up really nice. I said, thanks, Megs. <laughs> so I wasn't quite sure what to say next. And she said, um, she said Danny, are you going to be here in the morning? I said, yes, sweetie, I'll be here. She said, will you take me to school? I said, yes, sweetie, I'll take you to school. And she said, okay, good night. I said, good night. And I think in, in that moment, I realized the importance of what she was telling me as a little 10-year-old at the time, that you know what? She really, truly didn't care about an IPO or how much money we raised or traveling around in fancy planes. What she cared about is that her dad was gone for two weeks, and now he was home, and she was going to get to spend the day with him the next day. And maybe at the end of the day, that's what it's really all about, and that's why we're here tonight, to try to make sure that we can all spend another day, and hopefully many more days, with the people we love. And so we cherish it, we hold on to it, and we try to live it every day. That's why all of you being here to recognize some very, very special people is so important to us on the rare board, it's so important to us as entrepreneurs, as parents, and why it's going to make such a profound difference. And thank you very much.